Hi, I'm Brian. I'm here from industry and from the ruthless practical world um, somewhere on the East Coast. Hello, thank you all for having me. Um, I am not, at least in this room, I'm not a cryptographer. Maybe I can pass outside. And I see some faces here who tried to teach me crypto, but I'm not good enough at math. So I had to go into computer security instead. So now I have a lot of computers, and I'm responsible for their security. I don't expect you folks to know what Akamai is. Akamai is sort of a stagehand for the internet. It succeeds when other people shine. So when I say crypto at scale, by scale, what I mean is a quarter million or so computers like this. When you wake up in the morning, you want to see how the Olympics went, so do a couple billion other people. If a billion web requests all hit um, the Olympics web servers at the same time or NBC.com at the same time, NBC operators have a really bad day, right? Um, but folks want to watch the Olympics here at a certain time, um, and they want to go to NBC. Maybe folks in London want to watch the Olympics on the BBC and folks on the other side of the world on something else. So they can all share capacity in some sort of hierarchy of web caches. And if you're using the web, you're probably talking to Akamai computers, not whoever else you might expect to be talking to. When I say at scale, what I mean is on the order of a quadrillion requests a year, um, about two quadrillion in 2015, and roughly doubling a little faster than Moore's Law. And every request is about 60 kilobytes. So that's a lot of TLS handshakes, right? About a quarter of those turn into a TLS handshake. Um, so 250 billion, do I have that right? 250 trillion uh, TLS handshakes in a year. All done on about a quarter million machines. Most of them are web servers. The other chunk are some sort of infrastructure behind that. Of those, about 80,000 are one hierarchy, like I just showed you. Um, and they all share one certificate name, so you can reuse handshakes and you can redo session cookies with that. Right? Um, the slides will happily be online later if you want to instead of taking pictures too. Uh, why, do you, why would you want to use this? You use this if you're putting image tags in a web page and you don't want to serve all of them. So like maybe for social media, all those profile pictures, all those come from this. You use this if you want to do streaming video. All the Olympic stuff is coming back to this. Something where end users aren't going to see the host name. But there's a harder problem. If you want to do a whole website delivered over this sort of hierarchy, you have this problem because of um, historical realities about SSL and TLS. And so we end up with maybe 50,000 servers for vanity names. Right? So if you want example.com to work, um, we put that on this system. So this is what I mean when I say scale. Maybe 5,000 points of presence hosting 10,000 names on about 50,000 machines backed by a big pile of infrastructure. A consequence on that is that we're sitting on, at this point, between half a percent and one percent of all IPv4 addresses. So when you heard a year or so ago that the world had run out of IPv4 addresses, that was sort of a peak oil moment for us of realizing that, well, we've been doing something for 10 years, and we're going to have to do something else for the next 10. But all of that together is maybe 20 percent of web traffic. Um, and this sort of graphic is the kind of thing that we have to use to steer and explain it to ourselves. Each one of those little candles is a place where we have servers. Um, and you can see they're kind of concentrated in places where there's a lot of people, and maybe they're sparse around places where you don't see so, so much uh, IP use. OK, that's scale. What's crypto? Crypto, in general, is a tool for making things not work. <laughs> now, when I give this talk in a room that isn't entirely cryptographers, I say that's a cryptographer's definition. Uh, maybe, maybe not in this room. Uh, TLS, in particular, is a tool for making the web not work. If that's me, and that's a web server that I want to talk to, I want one arrow to work, and I want the other one to not work. What do I use for that? That's crypto. Crypto is the worst possible tool for all of the things that we use it for. And I mean that very seriously, right? Because of all the expense and all of the, the impracticality of, of multi-party computations and, and public key crypto and all of that, if we could possibly get away with using another tool, if I could just air gap things to keep them separate, why, I'd be delighted to use an air gap instead. Um, if I could have a safe in my office and put my secrets in there and I lock the door, I have much more faith in that safe and in the sheer physicality of its walls and the geography to access it instead of encrypting something and posting it to, to Dropbox. Right? So we only use crypto when we have to, and as a result, it's the worst possible tool for everything that we use it for. 
Um, my marketing people also don't seem to like this explanation. Somehow when I say we want to, to market the new encrypted secure websites and they're not going to work nearly as much as the other ones did, the product people tell me that I'm not allowed to talk to the customers anymore. So we have that in common. All right, I would like to tell you some stories. Crypto, in its function of having things not work, has, over the last five years or so, had a number of really bad days. Mostly days where either something worked that absolutely should not have worked, or uh, should have worked, or now I'm confused. Right, <laughs> something shouldn't have worked and did, um, and so we get things like Heartbleed, or something should have worked and crypto got in its way and didn't, and uh, things failed that should have worked. And that's some of the other ones up here. Um, we're gonna look at this bottom row of the big icons, and I'd like to tell you three stories. And out of those three stories, I'd like to bring some challenges from industry to say, as well as we understand you, and that's limited, um, here's what we'd love to have from you and some ideas that we'd love to work with you on, on how to take stuff from crypto research and bring it out to where the rest of the world can use it, right? Places where we have no tool, and so we want the worst possible tool because at least that's a possible tool. So let's start with the big one from 2014. Right? As of uh, the middle of 2014, people thought that the world might be ending for practical computer security, that we were gonna have years going on like this. Now, since this is not a sysadmin room, let me remind you, what was Heartbleed? Heartbleed was a bug in a popular crypto implementation called OpenSSL. It was a common sort of bug, the sort of bug you might expect static analysis programs from all over the world to find, and when consulted, they in fact did find it, so maybe we've learned something there. The important thing to know about it is that it, um, as a result of this bug, there was information flow from server memory to clients that shouldn't have been. What was conveyed in this information flow? Well, we're not sure. Really, anything that the server knew about might have gotten conveyed to some clients. Long-term TLS secrets, other web requests that were being handled, if this was a mail server, somebody else's email, or whatever the sysadmin was typing at the console, right? Pretty much anything that might have been sitting around in memory might get leaked out to clients. No one ever saw Heartbleed used in anger, but we all knew that it might have been, and it was so obvious that even though it, um, it had been live for a couple of years before it got discovered. Um, it was so obvious that surely somebody else might have or must have discovered this and used it. So this gives us a natural experiment. If you tell the world that your keys and secrets are compromised and everybody knows it, right? It's really easy to tell from outside who was exposed to Heartbleed. So tens of thousands of organizations got told your keys might have leaked, probably leaked, and everybody knows that they did. It isn't just that you, like, you accidentally lost a disk on the subway that had your TLS private keys on it. Everything's out there, and so you should probably rotate everything. So we get to see what happens when we tell people that. The answer is, um, the answer is alarming. So this is a graph over time of how many of those 10,000 or so vanity name certs get rotated. And what you see here, let me use the laser pointer instead because who could turn up the chance to use a laser like this? All right, what you see is a couple days of nothing happening. That's nothing happening because we thought maybe we don't need to rotate everybody's certificates. After all, nobody saw Heartbleed used in anger, and we had certificate authorities calling us up and saying, look, we didn't build in surge capacity. We can issue at maybe uh, our normal rate, maybe twice our normal rate. There's no way we can reissue all of the certificates used by all public websites in a matter of days. Uh, we just don't have the people for it. There's physical protocols involved of carrying keys between machines. Can't be done. Okay, then news stories started hitting and pundits started talking. And so within about a week or two, all the keys that we can rotate all by our lonesome have been rotated, right? So that's a little more than half the population. Over the next couple of weeks, there's a lot of phone calls and a lot of explanations of customers who need to, to rotate things. But sometime around mid-May, certainly by 45 days after the event, it slows down. And this right here is the ordinary keys expiring after two years. Right? So what that means is, that by, if you subtract that out, the, the, rate, the real update rate ends around the end of May um, from April 14th initiation. So 45 days after, if you didn't rotate by then, you weren't going to. You were just going to wait for your keys to expire 
uh, and, and move on from there. And you can even imagine the face of somebody who realizes, let's say they were on an extended vacation, and they got back after 90 days away, they left April 13th, a Friday, bad choice. They get back 90 days later, they're in here. And they're looking at, well, now what do I do? Well, maybe his certificate only expires over here, so he says, he'll wait, it's been 90 days already, what's another 10 or 20 or 60? Um, but here we have about 25% of the population don't usefully rotate, at least 15% um, don't respond to public notice that their long-term keys are compromised by doing anything about it. Isn't that neat? Right? I always used to think that the sort of protocols that said, um, we'll use a, a long-term key as an identifier with somebody, and we'll have some number of uh, compromised parties in the network, I wondered about how realistic that was. And this is a new uh, translation of that model that at least 15% of people in the world who've heard that their keys were compromised didn't do anything about it, right? They're not actively malicious, they're just passively malicious. And this is the best case. This is for people where you could look from outside and see that their keys were compromised and they knew it and they knew that recursively, right? If you look at a protocol on the back end, uh, there we go, like streaming video. You've been watching the Olympics this week, right? The way streaming video works in the modern world is all over web protocols. There's a camera pointed at an athlete, and that camera is connected by a big, thick cable to a machine called an encoder. Um, and an encoder is a translator from the sort of protocols that a video camera speaks to internet-like protocols. And the encoders are terrible, right? So if you're a camera person and you're a streaming video person, you care about your lenses. You care about the sensors in your camera. You don't really care about the encoder. The encoder is there as a sort of a piece of magic. The encoders make that video available to something like Akamai, and they do it over HTTP with basic authentication. Maybe, maybe they use TLS, and if they do, maybe they check the certs, maybe not. But so you should think about this as there's a password embedded in that, and if you looked around on Pastebin and the dark corners of the web, you can find the URLs for those encoders, or that the encoders use to talk to Akamai, and I devoutly hope you can't find the password. Because if you can find the password, you can have your video stream go out instead of Simone Biles. Um, and that'll be exciting for everybody, <laughs> especially me. Um, we had some heart attacks about that this year, right? People who set up new encoders and it wasn't working right, and whole countries were getting the wrong thing instead of the Olympic stream, all kinds of excitement. Um, not NBC, thank goodness. Uh, but there's a problem. If you want to rotate that password, let's say I accidentally tell you that the password for NBC for the Olympics is actually the word NBC password. Um, please don't try that. Uh, <laughs> and now I've got to change the thing, right? So there's a relatively ordinary three-step process to go from, all right, client and server agree that the password is A, the server starts accepting two passwords, the client starts sending the new one, the server stops accepting the old one, right? And just straightforward three steps to rotate a password, this should be normal. There's a problem, the encoders are terrible. The encoders only have one password field, right? Many of these encoders were literally purchased in the 90s and set up, there's some sort of appliance. Uh, you may not be able to get a replacement, the people who made it are out of business, there's no software for them. You could buy a new one, right? If this were only went one way, if it were just a matter of getting, right, the, the client here only ever has to know one password at a time, right? So that could be the, the solution. Akamai can accept two passwords, and you'll just set up a new encoder, or you'll, you'll change it over. Uh, doesn't work that way. Typically, the encoder's the server, and the, the, what you would think of as the web servers, the Akamai stuff is all pulling from there. So you can't rotate it. Most of these that are used for live video around the clock are feeding into things like satellite installations and into local television. And because of consequences of the protocol I don't want to go into here, if you rotate that password, you have to restart the stream on the encoder, and that requires someone at every other endpoint to push a button, just one button, uh, in order to start the stream working again. That means to change that password, if I actually do tell you the NBC Olympics password, someone at every local tele NBC affiliate television station in the United States needs to push a button to say, try again. Right? So we considered sending out a great number of undergraduate interns or something to do with like a drinky bird that could push the button, um, but what actually happens in, in reality is these passwords have not been rotated in typically more than 15 years and cannot be. 
right? Anyone who adopted live streaming video in the early days of streaming video on the internet is pretty much stuck with this. What's the, <laughs> the empty string, of course. And I see you all wrote it down. So uh, this is, all of these, those passwords were, of course, in memory when Heartbleed happened. So all of those folks we also caught in contact with and said, maybe you want to do something. Like if you were thinking about deploying new encoder hardware, maybe now is the time. It's April, the summer sports season is starting up. Um, you maybe want to do this before the World Cup because you can't do it during the World Cup. Um, you could advertise it as you're offering new Ultra HD, whatever other features you're gonna pack in. And the answer was, we can't do it, we're not gonna do it, nobody's rotating passwords on this, they're stuck. So I could show you a graph for this, for uptake of rotated passwords for streaming, but it's just a flat line, nobody did. Literally nobody. And there's about 300 other secret classes that we were tracking in, uh, over the, the months after Heartbleed to see what happened when you tell the world, basically everybody who's using OpenSSL, you have to change your secrets, you should rotate them, even if you were using something like Windows S channel that didn't get compromised, your counterparties were using OpenSSL, so you should change that. And the answer is, at the best case, 15% of people ignore you. In the more typical case, nearly everybody ignores you, and sometimes absolutely everybody ignores you. So much for long-term secrets as identities. Next crisis. Uh, some of the people I demoed this on said they wanted to know why I was putting a duck astronomer on the slides. This is not a duck astronomer, as anyone can tell. This is a poodle, carefully hand-drawn. <clears throat> I don't know why he's looking at the stars. Poodle was another event that happened later in 2014, and Poodle's really interesting, because Poodle, in a lot of ways, isn't a technical failure. Poodle was the world finding out that SSL3 from the 90s was broken. Now everybody here knew that SSL3 from the 90s was broken, that's why we built TLS1 and 1.1 and 1.2 and so on, right? Um, but this was a case where there was a crisis of faith. Crypto is about belief and about faith, and that faith and that belief around SSL3 were suddenly shaken. And so everybody's got to run off to the revival tent and um, make absolution somehow and sacrifice a goat or a poodle and try to get po uh, proper security again. But it gives us another natural experiment. What happens when the whole world has a crisis of belief and they suddenly believe they've got to turn off SSL3 in like a weekend? It did come out, I think, a Friday night. Um, and I have dark memories of walking the wrong way into the office building against the tide of people leaving because we were going to go try to deal with this. What we saw, I can't quite show you. I have this image in my head, but it was from our live telemetry systems and I didn't think to take a screenshot. So I've sketched what I was looking at the night that the world found out SSL3 is broken, here's a specific way that it's broken, and we think we're going to see exploitation of this at national borders within three days. Right? Our threat intel teams went and made some phone calls and they came back to us and they said, we think that SSL3 across national borders by the end of the weekend, by Monday morning, um, the, the Americans will have something up, the, the Chinese will have something up, the Russians, the French, whatever, and so all the national border po tapping points are going to be seeing poodle exploitation in like 72 hours. So you have to move now, 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 now. Now, that didn't happen, and there's a separate operational talk about why the threat intel predictions were wrong there. But this is what I saw that night trying to make that decision. So I want you to ask yourself what you would do if you got that message. This is a locus of um, a population. And it's log log, um, mostly because that lets you see a big line across it. Otherwise, it just looks like a great big letter U. Um, that this says nearly all of those 10,000 vanity domain names, those 10,000 websites, call them roughly the biggest 10,000 websites on the internet, nearly all of them get basically no SSLv3 traffic. They get a little bit, right? There's, a, there's little tiny fractions that come in from somebody writing a, a script in like Java 6 or something and running that and it only speaks SSL3 or somebody who's behind some horrible academic proxy at, at a horrible university and it only does SSL3 going forward, some abandoned hardware, whatever. So there's a little bit, but essentially they get none and they wouldn't notice or care if we turn it off. Um, maybe 100 customers or so have 1% of their traffic as SSLv3 and then Basically, nobody has more than 10% of their traffic as SSLv3, except for six or 700 stalwart diehards who thought that SSL3 got it right and they're not okay with ever switching to TLS, and so they're still running, their entire website is running on SSLv3. And so they're using a 16-year-old dead protocol, but maybe they too have now had a crisis of belief. 
So you might imagine we want to break this into chunks and sort of handle these by parts, right? Maybe you do a different thing for that set of people than for this set of people. And what we can do to try to help that bulk of population is we can see where can we turn off SSL v3, right? How, at what percentage point do I draw the line, right? Anyone think we should draw it at 10%? Do I, can I see hands? No, all right, how about 1%? Someone bold, good, a couple people. Uh, tenth of a percent? Couple, one in a million, the rest of you, I've put you to sleep. God, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, oh wait, good. 100%, oh, just, oh, I'm sorry, you're right, just turn it off for everybody, all right. So what we found was there's few enough people over in that camp that they can all get a phone call, right, that night and be told, hey, this poodle thing is happening, you need to do something about SSLv3, and your entire website seems to run on SSLv3, maybe you should do something about that, right? Because to fix it is, from the server point of view, is a couple checkboxes in a, a web portal, and then you fix whatever your clients are. And of course, a number of them said to us things like, I can't do that, my clients are deployed hardware. And we said, well, what are they? And they said, oh, they're automated teller machines. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we can't fix that, why, what are yours? Oh, city buses that are reporting in where they are. Oh, okay. Um, so what we said is, we're gonna draw the line at 1%. We looked in at some of what the data was, and we saw that a lot of what was hitting those 1% and less sites was web spiders, right? Sort of competitors to Google and DuckDuckGo and Bing and that sort of thing, who were crawling the web, but they were like little tiny ones that nobody had ever heard of, and as far as we could tell, we had no way to contact them, the couple of customers we spot checked in with had no idea who they were and said that's undesirable traffic, so go ahead and turn it off. So we set the line at 1% and we turned it off, and I almost ended up on the job market. Um, because it took about 90 minutes from pulling that, that lever over at about two in the morning, right, when not a lot of people were using it, but more importantly, when none of the operators were watching. Um, so about 90 minutes later, we start getting phone calls. Hey, something broke. You have to turn it back on. Um, and what a list they went through of what had broken, of um, I need SSL3, why? You only, we saw you only have one SSL3 transaction a month. Yeah, but that one a month is how I do payroll for my company. <laughs> oh, okay, or uh, I use SSLV3, came in um, several of the national banks from Venezuela and like big, big commercial and retail banks um, from South America came in and they said, we need SSLV3. Why? Our client population often has devices that can only speak SSLV3, right? They might be banking from like an old mobile phone or something, like a feature phone. It says Nokia on it. Uh, so how do we help those people? Well, you gotta get them new phones and until then, we have to have SSL3 on for banking. Even if that hurts the people who are using modern protocols to talk to you too? Yeah, even so, I can't turn off five, 10% of my user population. Oh, okay. Or um, the best ones, I ha uh, a video game company called in that makes both set-top boxes and um, uh, small portable devices. And they said, our entire infrastructure, all of our uh, little handheld gaming platforms and all of the, the set-top boxes, Oh, the whole, there's a big web store, you can put in a credit card number and download apps and so on and, and play the great games of the 80s. Uh, all of those use SSL3 and they can't speak anything else and we don't have the engineering resources to put out something new. We said, okay, we've got to turn it back on for them. And so we're turning back on spot checks here, there, and there. And then the world's second largest router manufacturer called back and said, you have to turn it back on. And we said, what, a, how could you possibly? And they said, well, we missed something. Um, okay, that the update mechanism to update firmware on their routers use SSL3. It also had end-to-end -end checks, but it would only, they, they'd said it's okay for us to not upgrade this because it's fragile, why break it? If we break this, we have to ship disks to a billion people. Um, so we'll just leave it in place. After all, there's an end-to-end -end signature, so there's an end-to-end -end integrity check, so we didn't care so much that it was SSL3, but now we needed to work over SSL3 so that we can continue pushing updates. We swear we'll get another update out and then you can turn it off. Oh, okay, how long will that take? 18 months. <laughs> okay, and that's again from mass consciousness within the computer security community that said, this has to go this weekend. And we ended up with a Swiss cheese array of turned off and turned on and uh, pulling people aside to try to fix this. Uh, and the core issue that made this so dangerous for the world was that the same keys are used for SL3 and TLS1 and 1.1 and 1.2. 
Right? So the next time that you write a paper and in an introduction you say Un uncompromised here means that these keys are used only in accordance with the protocol, remember that on my side of the world that never happens because the same keys get used across many iterations. Okay, one more disaster, and this one should be news for most of the folks in the room. That's a fossil. Um, fossil is an acronym for fixed origin SSL. Um, this is one that now I can talk about in public. Um, the issue is if there's end users who are talking to some uh, intermediate proxy, whether that's Akamai or a local blue code proxy or whatever's on the ResNet things that I see messing with my connection from the dormitories um, to, to get out to the internet, then there's a man in the middle, right, an approved one, an acceptable one maybe, uh, who's between the end users and the origins. And there's been this wonderful set of work um, from people like Ivan Rishtek at Qualys who did SSL labs. Right, this, for those of you who don't run a web server, this is a website you can go to when you tell it a server name and it examines it and it does all of the automated checks you'd want an expert to do to tell you how good that TLS endpoint is. This is fantastic because it tells people, by the way, you're terrible. Oh, I didn't know I was terrible. Uh, click here for instructions to not be terrible. So I do and it says, we saw here's the server version you're running. Here's a set of configuration uh, inputs you should put in. I do that and I run it again and it says, you're great. I love being told that. Right? So this is something that, that really moved the bar for operators. But what we found was that very many of the customers who were using services like us or other proxies had configured the proxies to not check their origin SSL configuration at all. Right? So uh, some, a tool like Ivan's, like, like the Qualys SSL lab scanner, can't see what's behind Akamai. It sees the Akamai edge and that looks wonderful. It tells us we're great and I love it. I check it every morning. Uh, but when you go to look behind the Akamai system, back to those origins, nobody was looking at that. And so the sysadmins of that population had not had that social feedback cycle of, of a customer calling them out and saying, you're terrible, fix it. So they had baked in crypto decisions, often in the 90s, early 2000s, were still living with them. Even better, they'd often told Akamai, don't ever break a connection going forward to the origin. Right? There's a little checkbox you can use when you're configuring a proxy like Akamai. You can either set the switch to check the origin cert, in which case it'll break when the origin cert expires, it'll break if the name is wrong, it'll break if, right, it'll break the connection if it should be broken. Or you can set the switch to don't do that, make it always work. All right, we're gonna do a show of hands again. Who thinks that everybody had that one set to, to where crypto will break things? Good, very well, really, all right. Who thinks that it was maybe about half and half? All right, do I hear in 90-10? 99%? Five. Not 5%, five. There were five customers who did get it right. <laughs> One of them was Akamai's own infrastructure. Um, the other four are wonderful, wonderful businesses that care a lot about end user security. Um, but let's just say that your bank and your newspaper and your email provider uh, maybe could have looked at this setting a little more carefully and thought harder. Um, right, statistically, everybody got it wrong. And we hadn't known, right? We shipped the setting, we, we shipped a manual for how to use the setting, and we discovered that basically everybody, given that choice, got it wrong. So we, we called some of them up, we flew out, we visited, we said, what were you thinking? Like to, you know, major banks, right? So we walked down Wall Street and just crossed the street back and forth through the banks, said, excuse me, we wanna to talk to you. We, we, in a routine review of your security configuration, we discovered that you don't actually check anything with TLS when it crosses most of the internet, right? So an end user is getting to, uh, if you go to access your bank from on campus here, there's Akamai servers on UCSB property. So you're talking to those with TLS and then the long haul back to New York is happening with no authentication and no integrity. Whoops. Uh, so we found that this happens, we'd like to fix it, and they said, oh, and they talked to us, they told us stories about how they put it this way in test mode to set up, right? They wanted to make sure that the site even could work because they think of crypto as a tool to break things. And then after that, it tested successfully and they never got around to shutting it off. We said, it's been 12 years. And they said, oh, yeah, all right. So it took four and a half years to move everybody across to where that's fixed and to where now essentially all of those forward connections use TLS, right? Overwhelmingly, they can pin a key. There's no need for PKI in this. It's a much simpler problem than, than major web crypto because there's only two parties, right? If, if, if example bank comes to us and says they wanna be a customer, they show us what key they're gonna use. They never have to rotate it. There's no need for certificates and dates. It's just, here's the key I'm gonna use, look for that. So it's just plain old public key crypto. And still, 
four years and more to, to get folks to adopt it. Um, so what do we learn from that? If you imagine a stereotypical cryptographic protocol, and, and forgive me, I'm, I'm from a sort of more, more algebraic world, of someone's gonna send a message and there's a little proof, and you send a message and there's a little proof before you send the message, right? And those proofs maybe bind some variables that you're gonna put in those messages. If at all possible, some implementer will leave out all the proofs and they'll just send the syntactic messages and they'll see that it worked. Right, so simulation-based proofs of security are a lot closer to reality than we thought. Um, <laughs> you can, in fact, operate as a cryptographic endpoint on the internet with no brain, uh, as we prove. Um, so that's an issue. And where we're starting to see some bending in that and some flex is around algorithms where you can't forget to check it, right? Where you're gonna, we're gonna give you something for secrecy and integrity, and you can't possibly decrypt the secret without calculating the integrity checksum along the way. That's a way to get these endpoints to actually do an integrity checksum. If they can skip it, they will, right? Even if they have to calculate it and send it back, but they don't have to compare themselves, um, someone will find a way to skip it. We heard the most amazing explanations about why people didn't want to upgrade their origins to actually do the crypto and to actually uh, provide certificates and get them checked. Some of us said, well, I can't put SSL there. Some of them even insisted you have to downgrade, SSL comes in, we want you to go forward over plain old HTTP. Um, I can't, I'd have to pay for it. Who here operates a web server of some sort? Okay. Um, all of you are using either OpenSSL or you're using Microsoft S Channel, right? Anyone else? Okay, so if you said to me, I can't turn on SSL, I'd have to pay for the SSL software module. That's weird, right? Like if you go talk to operators, that sounds bizarre until you hit the largest end of the scale and it turns out that a huge number of them were using defunct web servers um, and they baked in things, right? Like they had like AOL web server, AOL server with Tickle baked in. And so in order to switch web servers to something that supports modern crypto, they'd have to port all of their code from Tickle to Perl or something else. Um, or they had a caching, um, a load balancer. And the load balancer is a TLS man in the middle, just like our caching proxies. And they didn't have a service contract for it, right? They bought one, they took it off the shelf. The vendor says, you shouldn't use this unless you have a service contract. There's some software patches will happen, right? It's a complex machine that speaks like four different TLS state machines going at once. There are bugs in it. Well, we, didn't, we decided not to buy any of those. So we've just had it running since 2002. And uh, they went out of business and we need a new one so we'd have to pay for it. Um, we saw a huge number of folks from regulated industries who came in and said, I don't wanna have to do this. You can't make me do this. I'm regulated. And we said, what does that mean? And they said, well, they checked me out for my security. And we said, how did you get this past them? Uh, and they said, well, we did. My assessor says it has to be SSL. They didn't say it has to be good SSL. Um, so one of them told us, my assessor says it has to be SSL, so I can't change to this TLS thing. <laughs> um, we had a conversation with that assessor and managed to help them smooth that one out. Um, we heard, my next change window is in 2018. And remember, in some cases, we were hearing this in 2012. Uh, in some cases, we heard, yeah, we fixed it, switch it. And we'd switch it, and they'd say, oh my God, switch it back. Why? Well, we, we discovered we had another data center. We lost it. We'd wondered where that operating budget was going. It turns out we had another 10 machines in Chicago, and they haven't been updated in ages, and they can't speak modern protocols, so we're gonna have to work on that. Oh, but, but they have access to all of your, this was the bank, but they have access to like all the customer data? Oh yeah. Um, I closed an account after that one. Um, and the best ones were, I'm paying you to deal with the security, I shouldn't have to do anything. Um, and, and a number of those explained, they, they couldn't change it. They did not control their TLS stack. So this was people operating some of the biggest content sites on the web, right? Major media organizations said, I can't change my TLS configuration of my origin. Why not? I have no control over it. Well, who does? The IT department. <laughs> what? Well, so apparently their IT department is staffed with Morlocks, right? And so that's them over there, and they have an IT department that in some cases even ran a CDN of their own, right? They deployed thousands of machines around the world or, or in their service area, um, but they're paying us, and we're not cheap. Um, they're paying us piles of money to use us as a CDN instead. Why? Because if you're the marketing department or the content department at one of these, then it's much cheaper to pay us in money instead of, and you get to talk to some of our C-Care people, instead of using the free service, which is run by Morlocks. Um, and there's a message here for the enterprise IT groups 
of learning something about when they, when they cut staffing and they let the Morlocks uh, talk to the content department, then what happens is the content department interprets that as damage and routes around it. Um, that one I don't have a solution for, and I don't think there's a crypto solution for that, right? That one's gonna be a social problem. Okay, um, I said I would tell three stories, but this tells me I have 10 minutes left, so I have room for one more. Um, this is a story about something called SNI, and if you read carefully, that says, hello, your name is, uh, insert value here. SNI is an extension to TLS, and here's what it's for. This is a really basic cryptographic principle that says you should mention the names of the parties you're talking about. Original SSL and TLS, client sends to the server, hello, to some IP address. The server says back, hello, here's a certificate proving I'm example.com. And the client says, example.com, I don't want to talk to them, I wanted yacker.org. Huh. Um, so that broke a lot. And in the same way as zillions of other protocols from Needham Schroeder to Kerberos and everything else get fixed by mentioning the name a little bit more, the client should say to the server, hello, IP address, I want uh, a particular site, and the server can respond with, oh yeah, sure, I've got that certificate available here, I'll, I'll be that persona and I'll talk to you. All right, so all of the places you know that are using many, many host names on a small number of servers, um, like folks like us who are sitting on two to the 24th IP addresses. We're doing that because most clients, because some clients don't do this server name indication feature. They don't support SNI. Okay, how bad is it? Well, SNI got designed and introduced. This problem got recognized in 2001. It's still not commercially viable. Why not? It takes about five years before most clients actually start shipping SNI. It takes another five years before um, every browser you would plausibly buy and use has it when Android ships it in 2010. Three years after that, the standard Python and Java implementations still didn't support SNI, um, although they both did ship it near the, near the tail end of 2014, um, first weeks of 2015. It never made it in Windows XP, and it never made it, this one's gonna be key, into Android 2.2. Now, Android 2.2 is old, right? If you're carrying an Android device and you're in this room, the operating system probably starts with like a H or a K or something, right? It's way later than Froyo. Um, but in huge chunks of the world, if you go to buy a smartphone, you are probably getting a device that still runs, to this day, Android 2.2. Why? Because in 2.3, the licensing terms changed and Google gets more control over what's on them. So 2.2 is in some cases the last free Android, right? So there's a lot of folks out there still buying those phones. This is what we saw across the middle of 2014. Um, now what happened right around um, the end of April in 2014? Anybody know? No, not Heartbleed actually. This is a couple weeks after Heartbleed. Um, that's not Heartbleed. That is Microsoft killing off Windows XP. That is the expiration of service for Windows XP. It was courageous, it really was. If you look before that time, like I, I, I fit a line over it, but it's sort of an unhappy looking line with a lot of outliers, right? Um, you see these things binging up and down all over the place, and if anything, SNI adoption is trending downwards. How the hell can that be? Well, um, that's that there were more Android 2.2 machines showing up on the internet than there were machines getting fixed. Um, but then, Windows XP service ends, and within seven days after that, huge numbers of Windows XP machines vanish from the internet. Now, I can't tell where they went, right? I can just tell they stopped talking to me. So it might be someone pulled the power cable. I hope this is what happened. It might be someone pulled the network cable, and they're still running, but they're not on the internet, and so maybe they're safe. Um, it might be that they got stuck behind some proxy, so they're doing like TLS 1.0 locally, and then they're doing something more modern uh, outbound. Uh, could be, maybe that's not the end of the world, but they vanished. What's also notable is that the variance drops enormously. Why is that? The variance before, when you see these big outliers, that's where my sampling technology caught things on weekends. And what we observed before that date is that people had wonderful cryptographic tools available to them on Saturday and Sunday, and in the evenings. But Monday to Friday, their cryptographic tools suck. That's because they were using uh, Windows XP often, and that was the best tool they had, often paired with really atrocious intermediate proxies, right? And then after that, we see the variance dropping enormously. There's still some. Um, and when I looked at this, I pulled this data around October 2014, and I said, okay, 
thank God that, that Microsoft actually did that. Now I need to get someone to do that to Android 2.2, which is open source software, so who do I find to be the, act as the vendor for that? Um, so we'd started some conversations talking about it. Those conversations went on long enough that we got more data, and this is what we see now. So you can still see that jump, that jump that I, we just looked at is this jump, Right? And so before that, all the way back to 2013, there's some sort of vaguely sinusoidal, and I don't know what this is. There's some um, annual cycle related to like summer vacations maybe. Um, and then even that damps out. And sometime around January 2015, you start seeing something that you can at least pretend is exponential fall off in the number of old machines that don't support SNI. So we're winning. It's up around 97 and a half, 98% right now. Um, and, and trending smaller. And most of what's left there are the same things that I made fun of on the SSLv3 slide, right? So if we hadn't had the Poodle experience, I'd say, great, we're almost down to 1%. When it hit, hits 1%, just turn off all the old ones, no one will care. Um, maybe a little wiser now, we've learned, all right, we shouldn't do that. But the neat thing here is this one's more is server controlled. So, this, so you can do it um, server by server, customer by customer. Right? So if you wanted to stand up an e-commerce site now, you could have a perfectly profitable e-commerce site that only used SNI today, right, in the US. Now I hear that there are some user populations, say those where IT only comes in to upgrade the computers every one or two years. Maybe they don't have this world yet, right? In that world you might see 10% of the population can't do SNI. Um, the browser vendors have a slightly different view because they get telemetry from the browsers that tells them uh, what, what, what's happening. But big enterprises turn that off and don't send the telemetry. Right, so there is probably a hidden population out there of people who are behind proxies so I can't see them, not sending telemetry so the browser vendors can't see them, and taking no updates so they're exactly the ones who really need help. Um, for them, I advocate prayer uh, or replaced hardware. Okay, from that, what can we learn and what can we try to take forward? First problem, overwhelmingly, people don't actually rotate compromised secrets even if the fact of the compromise becomes public. So the mathematical model that says we're gonna associate a person with a long-term key, and that's the identity, um, doesn't hold, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a useful model, it tells you some useful things, but we're hitting its limits when we try to look at scale at how people are actually using crypto. Um, you knew people shared passwords. I'm here to tell you, maybe you've done it yourself, very naughty. I'm here to tell you that uh, there are people who are sharing cryptographic keys in exactly the ways that we don't want them to. Um, second thing to learn, protocols are gonna live for 10 to 15 years. It took SNI and Heartbleed and Poodle to kill off SSLv2 and V3, right? That was um, the worst crises we thought we could imagine at the time. So bad that even uh, if someone walks in at one of the post-quantum sessions and says, by the way, I brought my three kilobit quantum computer, let me tell you your RSA keys factors. Um, it will be 10 years from that date before we can get RSA off the public internet, at least. Right, because we had similar crises for these other protocols and we couldn't move. We have better infrastructure now, it's true, but we have more people and we have more weird old devices too. So the best model for the future is the recent past and um, I'm here from industry to say that the post-quantum uh, crypto world, we need from you a decision. Is it super singular isogenies? Is it lattice-based? Is it code-based? Um, we need something that we can start shipping and working with. Um, it's wonderful to see that Google and Mozilla and Akamai and a handful of others are playing at the edges. But we need from the theory world to know now, because we have this terrible feeling, the quantum computer people tell us that they're 10, 15 years out which means the time to start shipping mainstream browsers and mainstream crypto endpoints with post-quantum crypto in it is now. Um, it would be really good if we could do that this summer, so you're late. <laughs> um, moreover, keys will be shared between versions of the same protocol. Now there's social hacks we can do on that, right? That's not the next version of TLS, that's called Quick instead. So that should use different keys. Um, half worked, half didn't work. People actually shared keys between Quick and TLS uh, a bit too. Uh, there's a common meaning of uncompromised as used only in accordance with this protocol. We have these composability frameworks that tell us where you can bend around that. We could really use some more theoretical work to explain to industry what does it mean when I share keys between TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. 
what does it mean when I'm speaking HTTP over that most of the time, but sometimes something else, um, and we're mixing those keys together. We could use some help in understanding that. Um, and the last lesson is implementers will skip all imaginable checks, and some that are even not imaginable. Um, we have this model of honest but curious. I'd like to ask for some help on people who are honest but flaky. Right? People who are simulating a, a, a protocol participant, but they want to send every possible message they can, and they haven't really done their homework first. Cool. <laughs> Relatedly, um, what checks could we make unskippable? Right? In the same way that some of the AEAD constructions do, how could we make it so that you can't possibly get the secret unless the integrity check worked? And the more that we can build protocols that way, the safer we can feel about what some of these horrible, horrible implementers like me are doing. Thank you all very much for your time. I'll be here through Wednesday night. I'd love to talk more, and I'm really happy to take questions, and then we'll go have some lunch.